Hello, in this video we are talking about stars. Uh, what are the different types of stars that we see when we look out at the night sky? And what has our study of them told us about how stars uh, live and die and evolve? Uh, so here we go. Alright, you know some stuff about stars already. For example, you know that you can look at the spectrum of a star and figure out what it's made of. Uh, as light passes through the like outer layers of the atmosphere of the star, some of these different colors, some of these different frequencies, wavelengths get gobbled up by electrons that want to jump to higher energy levels in their orbits. Um, and so we can look at these and be like, ooh, these colors are missing, so there's a bunch of hydrogen, what have you. We can figure out what stuff is made of with those. We can also figure out the temperature of a star just by looking at Again, the colors of light coming off of it, and which one's the brightest? What's the peak wavelength when I make my black body radiation curve? Because remember the peak wavelength, there's a simple equation, just one other number, you do a little dividing, and you can find the temperature of that star. Um, you know, without like going all the way over there and sticking a thermometer in it, because we can't do that. We haven't nearly, nearly made it to even like the closest star. Um, so everything we know about stars has to come from the little tiny teeny bits of light that we can analyze and we can learn so much just from the light. One other fun kind of graph you can make by studying the light coming off of stars is called an HR diagram, a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. We just call it the HR diagram. This is a fun luminosity versus temperature like scatter plot. Um, back when they were you know, studying stars, they were trying to like categorize stuff and find ways to categorize them. And they noticed some interesting patterns come up when you make this plot of like luminosity and temperature. And if you study it, you learn a little bit about how stars evolve. This is a fun video. I'll put it in the um, little notes thing down below. If you want to take a look, it's just fun. It shows you how you can kind of make it from looking at a group of stars and then organizing them by luminosity and organizing them by temperature. Because if you do that, as long as you have a decent sample size of stars in the cluster you're looking at, you always get something that looks like this. So here's our HR diagram. You do want to sketch one of these and you want to be pretty specific. So I'll show you kind of what the IB wants you to know. But there are a couple different sections that always show up on this kind of graph. The first one, the big one, is the main sequence. And you have a sort of, it usually does kind of curve like this, a sort of diagonal-ish line. Um, curvy guy going from like top left or so to the bottom right or so. Then sort of separately, there's some other big groups. There are um some groups way over here that are very luminous but very cool think about how they could be possible they would have to be really big and we call these red giants there's other stars that are even brighter um ridiculously luminous we call those super giants and then there's those other mysterious stars which are like very 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 hot but very 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 not luminous and we call those the white dwarfs. Okay, you do want to know and try your best to sketch this out and have like a reference one because they're pretty specific usually um, and they want you to know ballpark these values. So the main sequence is a big one. It spans like the whole graph kind of, but you wanna know like the starting point is usually about 2,500 Kelvin. Um, where you're at about 10 to the minus three. This is how you usually see this. It's in reference to the sun. So one means the luminosity of the sun. This graph is actually not, <laughs> not great for this. Um, okay, but so like it's in terms of the sun. And so 10 to the minus three would mean one one thousandth uh, the power of the sun, 10 to the five, uh, 100,000 times the power of the sun, All right? So that's the range we start at 2,500 and one over a thousand times sun, and we go to about 30,000, about 10 to the five. Um, and you kind of like make a little, you know, curvy like this line going from start to end. The red giants, we usually classify like this. They have temperatures below 5,000 Kelvin, and they're like 
10, 100, maybe 1,000 times as powerful as the sun. We also have supergiants, which um, have a real wide temperature range as well. Usually we say something like 3,000 to 20,000, and they are like more than 1,000 times more powerful than the sun is typically how we say it. And then we have the white dwarfs, which are really hot, white hot uh, at least, and they have a temperature over 5,000 Kelvin and like a tenth to a, what, 10,000th uh, the luminosity of the sun. So they're a little section down here. Okay, so you want to know those regions, and we'll get into what's going on with these stars. Okay, when you look at any given sample of stars, most of them fall on the main sequence, something like 90%, give or take. The sun is a main sequence star, uh, and what it turns out to be is that stars spend most of their life uh, on the main sequence, we say sometimes. Most stars are here when you look at a given sample because that's where stars spend most of their time. The sun has been doing this, fusing hydrogen into helium for 5 billion years. It'll do it for another 5 billion years or so. Um, okay, so most of them are on the main sequence. The main thing you want to know is main sequence stars are like, you know, in the prime of their life, and they are fusing hydrogen into helium. That's the thing stars love to do. Okay, red giants are very cool stars because they're only red hot, which remember is not like uh, very hot on the temperature scale. Blue is the hot side. Uh, so they are relatively cool and very luminous, which means they must be gigantic. And the reason they're so big is because they have moved on to the next stage of their life. They are now taking the helium that's built up in the core, fusing it into heavy, heavier elements, which uh, makes it expand very, very, very much. Supergiants are basically a red giants times a lot. They're just really, really, really big stars doing that to a very, very big extent. And white dwarfs, what it turns out these are, is they are the remnants, stellar remnants, we call them, the leftover core long after a star has finished its life, it's fused everything it's going to fuse, and some stars will end up as white dwarfs, which is you basically just end up with the core, which is more or less a rock of carbon um, that's just slowly cooling, and it takes billions or even maybe trillions of years uh, like longer than the age of the universe, it might take these things to cool off. But they're just white hot rocks floating in space, the leftover remnant of a star. Some other things about the HR diagram you want to know. Um, sometimes you'll see this, and the IB occasionally mentions it. Um, there's an instability strip, which is like a little above the sun and then kind of up and off the main sequence like this. Uh, fun fact, the North Star, Polaris, is a, is a, on the instability strip. It's what we call a variable star. And what this means is the luminosity kind of changes at a regular rate. These are really useful for taking measurements and stuff. Um, but just kind of know that there are some stars that they essentially like kind of get a little bigger and a little smaller. Their equilibrium is a little out of whack, and they kind of uh, go from bright to dim to bright to dim. It's a pretty small change, but they have like this periodic regular um, period of dimming and brightening. So they are variable stars, and we call it the instability strip, which is this is where they tend to be. You will also see this drawn on HR diagrams sometimes. Check out our cognitive if you want to fun like reasoning, math reasoning for why it kind of works this way with like how this weird log graph works and all this. But Basically, anything along one of these lines are like stars of the same size. So um, if you have like a 3,000 Kelvin star that's a tenth the size of the sun, it's going to be really, really not luminous. If you have a 30,000 Kelvin uh, star that's a tenth the rays of the sun, it's going to be much more luminous. And so it just kind of shows that trade-off, but just know these show up there. So if you're reading diagonally like this on a uh, HR diagram, you're looking at stars of the same size, stars of the same rate. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how stars evolve. 
All stars start the same way. Um, all stars come from nebulae, nebulas. There are giant, enormous uh, clouds of gas all through space. And what happens is you get a little section where it's a little denser than all the other sections of this big giant gas cloud and all the gas starts to condense. If you've got enough, there's like a cutoff mass and if you've got enough mass, that stuff can all coalesce and form a big giant ball of gas and that ball of gas squeezes its inside so hard that it starts to fuse uh, hydrogen into helium. So as it's like forming from the nebula, we call it a protostar. And then once fusion starts, now it's a real star, baby. It's a main sequence star now when it's doing this. So this is like the definition of main sequence when the star is fusing hydrogen to helium. Um, okay, then what happens for all stars? This takes different amounts of time. The sun is doing it at a pretty steady rate. Really big stars burn up their fuel super fast. Little stars are very, you know, efficient and take their sweet time. Um, but eventually, stars will more or less run out of hydrogen or it runs low enough that gravity starts to win. And that equilibrium we talked about gets out of whack. The gravitational pressure starts to beat the radiation pressure, the outward pressure from fusion, because fusion's slowing down, which means the star starts to collapse on itself, it starts to shrink. Gravity's winning, gravity's winning and it's going to uh, condense and condense and condense. Well, as it does that, the temperature in the core is going to rise. All right, and here's that idea, that really big stuff tends to burn its fuel quicker. Smaller stars burn at a really slow rate. So the lifetimes of these stars vary uh, really a whole lot. Some are like millions of years and some are many, many billions of years. Okay, here's a couple, this is a good, super famous picture um, of what we call the Pillars of Creation. This is a really famous nebula, the Eagle Nebula. Um, and we got a picture from the Hubble Telescope and a newer picture from the James Webb Telescope. But one crazy thing, this pillar here is about four light years across, which is crazy, crazy, crazy distance it's like impossible to imagine the scale of this. Like if you shine a light here, it takes four years to get down here, traveling at the speed of light, right? And every little dot you see in here is a star. So all of these points are stars being formed. So this is like from a very, very, very zoomed out view, a bunch of gas floating in space. And when enough gas like condenses to a point, you get a little star form. So this is like a stellar nursery, we call it. Look, it's all these little baby stars being born. Um, here's another picture of what uh, a protostar would kind of look like. Um, you know, we got an artist depiction here. This is a, a, a thing that, uh, a fun career, if you want. But, you know, uh, we don't have good enough telescopes to like see a protostar in this kind of detail. But this is what it would sort of look like. You got a gas cloud swirling around. And in the center, fusion is kind of starting to start. It's starting to get super hot. Um, and all this other gas cloud might eventually condense and form some planets and such that all, you know, spin around, like spinning a pizza. All right, but that's kind of the idea of a protostar. So this is where things like kind of diverge. Everything starts as a protostar. Then it's a main sequence star once the hydrogen starts to fuse into helium. What happens next depends on the mass of the star. So we'll first talk about low mass stars, in other words, sun-like stars. Uh, the sun is like a completely, completely average, boring star. It is a very like middle of the road in every kind of category that you could have for stars. Um, yeah, so it's a very, very normal star. And um, the really big stars do different stuff. But this is what stars like the sun do. Uh, and what will happen with the sun? When it starts to collapse, like we said, the core gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and eventually gets so hot that the helium that's built up over billions of years, maybe, um, gets hot enough to fuse to other helium. Right? At the normal star temperature, we can just do hydrogen into helium, but it's not hot enough. The heliums aren't going fast enough to hit the other heliums and fuse before they repel. But as the star starts to collapse and gets even smaller, it gets even hotter, 
and you do get to this point where the helium all pretty rapidly starts to fuse into carbon um, and the star will expand at this point really really big and grow into a red giant we are pretty sure that the sun when it does this is going to swallow up and incinerate the planet earth but you know five billion years from now um okay this stage goes a lot quicker than the first stage still a very very long time on our you know time scale we're used to but compared to like its fusion on the main sequence this is a lot briefer so it pretty quickly burns up its helium the helium starts to run out and it starts to compress again okay now here's where for the sun and stars in like that same ballpark size or smaller there's not going to be enough mass to like compress the um now carbon mostly is what the helium fuses into there's not going to be enough to get those hot enough to fuse with each other and so it just kind of runs out um, and slows down, stops fusing, and you got just a ball of carbon that you've built up by fusing all of these things. Slowly over time, the outer layers of the star are going to blow away and form what we call a planetary nebula. Um, okay, and what stops it from collapsing on itself? This is a fun little detail. It's called electron degeneracy pressure. Um, so what this kind of is, is you've got your ball of carbon at the core of the sun. Still, you do have like the whole mass of the outer star trying to push in on it, trying to compress it even further. But to kind of compress it beyond this point, you would have to compress it so much that the electrons would be like right on top of each other, which is not allowed. There's a Pauli exclusion principle, a fun little quantum -y thing that says that's not allowed. Electrons can't be literally right on top of each other. So it's almost an electron pressure. It's kind of like the electrons repelling. It's even more weird than that. But basically, the electrons can't be any closer together. And so you can't make the core any smaller. And this pressure now fights the gravitational pressure. The radiation pressure is gone, but you have this kind of outward pressure from electrons not wanting to collapse into the atom. Um, and that's what leaves us with this ball of carbon. So that's what's a white dwarf. Okay, here is a little sketch on the HR diagram showing the evolution of like the sun is a good one. The IB will ask you to do this. Um, they will give you like an HR diagram and say, okay, it's like two times the mass of the sun. Draw what it's going to do on the HR diagram. So this is just showing over time how the luminosity and temperature of a star will change. So the sun hangs out here for 10 billion years runs out of hydrogen, starts to fuse helium. Um, it does some fun like kind of back and forth up here. All you would need to draw is that it goes up here, it becomes a red giant, gets much brighter and cooler. And then um, as it runs out of fuel, it's gonna shed this planetary nebula. We got a white dwarf left. And again, for the IB, they'll do it pretty simple. They would just want you to draw a line then and show we end up like somewhere here-ish in the white dwarf zone. And way, 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 way later, that thing will cool down. But so for the IB, for something like the sun, you would pretty much say we start here, it goes up here to a red giant, and then it comes down here to be a white dwarf. And last for this, just some pictures. Um, all right, so here's some, uh, again, telescope pictures of the whole white dwarf planetary nebula thing. So this is the remnant of some sun-like stars way after They've done the whole red giant thing, finished all of their fusion. You get this little white ball. That's a white dwarf. That's a ball of carbon. That is truly the same thing as like a hot charcoal sitting on your grill. It's just, you know, a really, 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 really big piece of charcoal. Um, Earth-sized piece of charcoal, maybe. And the outer layers of the star, this is all of the gas that was on the outer layer outside the core that's slowly being like blown away. Same thing over here. You can see there's the little white dwarf, the little remnant, and this is all what was the whole outside of the star, and you can really see it here in this one being, like, blown away. All right, the same kind of gas cloud that the um, star came from gets pushed back out. So we call this a planetary nebula um, is these kind of smaller-scale nebula coming from dying red giants.
Okay, uh, I'm going to split this up. That's part one. In part two, we are going to talk about the evolution of high mass stars, the more exciting ones. So I'll see you there.